Okay, guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel here. Um, we're reading section 13, or pardon me, chapter 13, section 2, starting on page 394. It's titled, The North's People. Not the Norse people, the North's people. All right, page 394. American Diary. Over there, Germany, alas, common sense and free speech lie in shackles. I invite you to come over here should you want to obtain a clear notion of genuine public life, freedom of people, and sense of being a nation. I have never regretted that I came here, and never, never again shall I bow my head under the yoke of despotism and folly. This is from uh, August Blumner, a German immigrant quoted in News from the Land of Freedom. Page 395, Northern Factories. Main idea. Many workers in the mid-1800s saw the need for reforms in working conditions. History and you. Do you babysit or mow lawns to earn money? Is the pay fair? Read to learn why workers in the mid-1800s wanted to earn more pay and improve their working conditions. For many immigrants like uh, uh, August Blumner, America meant freedom and liberty. Immigrants often settled in cities and found work in the many mills and factories there. Working conditions were harsh, however, and reforms were needed. Between 1820 and 1860, America's manufacturing increasingly shifted to mills and factories. As numerous machines took over more production, tasks, uh, <laughs> sorry, as numerous uh, machines took over more production tasks, these tasks were brought under one roof, creating the factory system. In addition to textiles and clothing, Factories produced items such as shoes, watches, guns, sewing machines, and agricultural machinery. Working conditions. As the factory system developed, working conditions worsened. Employees worked long hours, averaging 11.4 hours per day by 1840. Factory work involved many dangerous conditions and longer workdays caused on-the-job accidents. For example, long leather belts connected the machines to the factory's water power drive shaft. These belts had no protective shields. Workers, especially children, often suffered injuries from the rapidly spinning belts. Many workers lost their fingers and broke their bones. Employees often labored under unpleasant conditions. Factories were miserably hot and stifling in the summer. The machines gave off heat and air conditioning had not yet been invented. Most Americans had no heating in the winter and workers were cold. Factory owners were often more concerned about profits than about employees, uh, than, than employees' comfort and safety. No laws existed to regulate working conditions or to protect workers. Page 396. Workers attempt to organize. By the 1830s, workers began organizing to improve working conditions. Fearing the growth of the factory system, skilled workers formed trade unions organizations of workers with the same trade or skill. Steadily worsening working conditions also led unskilled workers to organize. In the mid-1830s, skilled workers in New York City staged a series of strikes. They refused to work in order to put pressure on, employee, on employers. Workers wanted to receive higher wages and to limit their workday to 10 hours. Groups of skilled workers formed the General Trades Union of New York. In the early 1800s, going on strike was illegal. Striking workers could be punished for breaking the law, or they could be fired from their jobs. In 1842, a Massachusetts court ruled that workers did have the right to strike. It would be many years, however, before workers received other legal rights. African American workers. Slavery largely disappeared from the North by the 1830s. However, racial prejudice, an unfair opinion not based on facts, and discrimination unfair treatment of a group remained. For example, New York no longer required white men to own property in order to vote. However, few African Americans were allowed to vote. Rhode Island and Pennsylvania uh, passed laws to keep free African Americans from voting. Most communities would not allow free African Americans to attend public schools. Many communities barred them from public facilities as well. Often African Americans were forced into segregated or separate schools and hospitals. A few African Americans rose in the business world. Henry Boyd owned a furniture manufacturing company in Cincinnati, Ohio. In 1827, Samuel Cornish and John B. Russworm founded Freedom's Journal, 
the first African-American newspaper in New York City. In 1845, um, Mason B. Allen, or uh, Macon maybe, B. Allen became the first African-American licensed or given official authority to practice law in the United States. Most African-Americans, however, were extremely poor. Women workers. Employers also discriminated against women, paying them less than male workers. Men excluded women from unions and wanted them kept out of the workplace. Some female workers tried to organize in the 1830s and 1840s. Sarah G. Bagley, a weaver from Massachusetts, formed the Lowell Female Labor Reform Organization. Her group petitioned for a 10-hour workday in 1845. Because most of the petitioners were women, the legislature did not consider the petition. Women like Sarah Bagley, however, paved the way for later movements to, to correct the injustices against female workers. Reading check. Describing. How did the conditions for workers change as the factory system developed? The rise of cities. Main idea. European immigrants often face hardships and dis discrimination when they settle in northern cities. History and you. Do you have Irish or German ancestors or know someone who does? Read to learn why many Irish and Germans came to the United States. The growth of factories and immigration. The movement of people into a country went hand in hand with the growth of northern cities. Both natural born citizens and immigrants flocked to the cities where most of the factories were located. American manufacturers welcomed immigrants, many of whom were willing to work for low pay. Increase in urban population. Between 1820 and 1840, some Midwestern towns that had been small villages located along rivers developed into major cities. Page 398. St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and Louisville pro profited from their waterfront locations. They became growing centers of trade that linked the farmers of the Midwest with the cities of the Northeast. After 1830, the Great Lakes became a center for shipping, and new urban centers such as Buffalo, Detroit, Milwaukee, and Chicago arose. The larger cities became even larger. The population of New York City, the nation's largest city, passed 800,000. Philadelphia had more than 500,000 people in 1860. Immigration. Immigration in the United States increased dramatic dramatically between 1840 and 1860. The largest group of immigrants to the United States at that time were, were from Ireland. Between 1846 and 1860, more than 1.5 million Irish immigrants arrived in the country. They came to the United States because of a potato blight that destroyed most of the Irish potato crops in the 1840s. A famine, an extreme shortage of food, struck Ireland. More than a million people died. Mostly farmers, the Irish immigrants were too poor to buy land. For this reason, many settled in the Northeast and took low-paying factory jobs in the cities. Many of the Irish men also worked on the railroads. Accounting for nearly half of the immigrants, Irish women became servants and their factory workers in the northern cities. The second largest group of immigrants in the United States between 1820 and 1860 came from Germany. Some sought work and opportunity. Others came because the German Democratic Revolution had failed. Many arrived with enough money to buy farms or open their own business. They prospered and founded their own communities and self-help organizations. Some German immigrants settled in New York and Pennsylvania, but many moved to the Midwest and the Eastern Territories. The Impact of Immigration the European immigrants who came to the United States between the year of 1820 and 1860 changed the character of the country. These people brought their language, customs, religion, and traditions with them. Some of their ways of life filtered into American culture. Before the early 1800s, the country had relatively few Catholics. Most of them lived around Baltimore, New Orleans, and St. Augustine. Most Irish immigrants and about one half of the German immigrants were Roman Catholics. Many Catholic immigrants settled in cities of the Northeast. The church provided spiritual guidance and served as a center of community life for the newcomers. The German immigrants brought their language as well as their religion. When they settled, they founded their own publications and established musical societies. Immigrant face, immigrants face prejudice. In the early, pardon me, in the 1830s and 1840s, anti-immigrant feelings rose. Some Americans feared that some Americans feared that immigrants were changing the character of the United States too much. People opposed to immigration were known as nativist. They believed that immigration threatened the future of native American-born citizens. Some nativists accused immigrants of taking jobs from real Americans, real in quotes, and were angry that immigrants would work for lower wages. 
Others accused immigrants of bringing crime and disease to American cities. Immigrants who lived in city slums were likely targets of this prejudice. The Know Nothing Party. Nativists formed secret anti-Catholic societies. In 1850, they formed a new political party, the American Party. Because members of nativist groups often answered questions about their organization with the statement, quote, I know nothing, close quote, their party came to be known as the Know Nothing Party. The Know, Noth the know Nothings called for stricter citizenship laws. They wanted to extend the immigrants' waiting period for citizenship from 5 to 21 years and to ban foreign-born citizens from holding office. In the mid-1850s, the Know Nothing movement split into a northern branch and a southern branch over the question of slavery. At this time, the slavery issue was also dividing the, no the northern and southern states of the nation. Reading check. Identifying. Which two nations did most immigrants come from in the mid-1800s? Section 2 Review. Number 1. Define each of these following terms. Trade union. Strike. Prejudice. Discrimination. Community. License, famine, nativist. Number two, listing. This is under main ideas. List some of the early attempts at work reforms in the North. Number three, discussing. Why did some Americans object to immigration? Okay, guys, that's it for chapter 13, section two, and Copley and Toothless out.